Hi everyone, welcome to the Eagle Podcast. I am your host, Rob Watson. I'm doing a solo episode today. It's been a while to this and it's called It's Always Darkest Before the Dawn. And I'm wanting to do this one because some things have been coming up for me, what I'm seeing in the external world, what's going on in my own life, transformations that are happening. Before I do, I just want to say I really appreciate anyone who supports me on my Patreon page. And I'm also supporting Positive News Magazine, which is a magazine for doing good journalism about good things. Something I promote very much with this podcast is about all the good things that's happening in the world. It's really important that I believe we shine a light on the good amidst all the darkness. Ties in well with the title of this podcast. And I think there's so many good things. I've always said this so many times, but I'll continue to beat it. I think there's so many good things happening in the world. And the more we can tune into that, the more we can focus on that, we can actually then be part of the solutions rather than maybe just being swept up in a place of fear, which can put us into the fight or flight mode, being very fearful of the future, thinking too much about the past. Can we bring ourselves into more the moment and then take inspired action to do great things in our life and to help people around us and community and to live an authentic life, empowered life? So that's what I tend to do with this podcast. I speak with people who are out there doing these things already, who are living authentic ways, who are making a huge indifference to the community. And my aim has always been to inspire the listeners to go out and do their own bit of good in the world. So yes, um, that ties in with Positive News Magazine, so you can get a subscription through them. I have an exclusive offer. Uh, You put Do Good 20 in at checkout and you receive 20% off. That's Do Good 20, all one word. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. So moving into today's podcast. Now, yes, like I mentioned, I think it's really important that we focus on the good, that we tune into that, we take inspired action. But that doesn't mean that we should bury our head in the sands when we're seeing things that feel like they're out of alignment with us, do not feel authentic, do not feel like truth, feel like maybe we're having the wool pulled over our eyes, we're being lied to, we're being deceived, we're being coerced. And I believe in many ways, We're seeing two sides of the coin um, the last 18 months that we've been living in through COVID. Um, For me, um, I'll just be straight, like I'm going to probably be quite open on this one and talk about some of my own thoughts and feelings in it. And I don't expect everyone to agree with this. And I think that's a really important thing that we're open and willing to listen to people that have different opinions because what I'm seeing at the moment, now I've never in all my life seen so much divide that's going on. In society, whether it was you wear a mask or you won't wear a mask, whether you get vaccinated or you, whether you don't get vaccinated. You know, there's so much we're getting pitted against each other. And I think when you look at governments and how authoritarian measures are in place, they end up through divide in people. They can rule people. They can rule the masses more when they divide us. And I, my intention is to unite, you know, to unite us. I want to be, like I said, part of the, the solution think what we've seen in the last 18 months is the response to COVID has really had, for me, I think in many ways it's been anti-health what the government has been proposing. You know, there's been so much fear pumped into people and uncertainty. The figures or the projections that they put into the future are always, you know, fear for me, it's fear mongering. We need people in power in positions of authority that are giving us empowering, supportive information critical thinking is so important at this time. I think the measures of the past 18 months, what I think we're going to look back in time, personally speaking, I think we're going to look back in time and see that the COVID measures, the measures that have been put in place by the government are going to be one of the biggest mistakes that has ever been done by governments around the world. And it'll be bring about the biggest possible shake up in our society to see that the people that are in them positions, I personally don't think they're doing it for the best interests of peace of health. I don't think it's into supporters for us. I think it's for different, there's different gains in this for them. You know, locking away healthy people for 12, 18 months. The effects of that, like mental health issues have gone through the roof. You know, telling people not to go outside, not to be with people, not to be in community, not to be with friendships particularly young, healthy people who are pretty much are not going to have any impact from getting COVID, particularly if they're helpful. And of course, people can say, well, you know, you've got to protect the vulnerable, but we can protect the vulnerable in other ways. Other things, you know, suicides are, are massively on your poverty. It's huge. If you were to ask people, I think maybe a million people have been pushed into the poverty line. Would you ask some of them people what they rather have? Maybe have got sick with COVID, like most people that get it are catching 
it's like flu-like symptoms. Some get it even really milder than that, you know, just a cough and a headache. Would you rather them, would you choose based on that to have that or would you like to be pushed into poverty and be on the breadline and really be struggling to, to put a roof over your head, to feed your family? And I believe that a lot of these draconian measures that are in place, it isn't, for me, it's not to support health. And I, I'd wind back a little bit earlier in the year. We went for, a, went for a drive, drove away 10 minutes from the house and went for a walk. Well, we were going to go for a walk. And as we pulled up, there was police there asking where we were from. I said, oh, you know, it was 10 minutes drive down the road. And it's like, and they basically threatened us. If we got out of the car, I was there with my little baby at the time. She was only four months, five months old. We we're going to take her for a walk in nature and fresh air. And they were going to threaten us with a 200 pound fine each if we got out of the car. And I was really frustrated because uh, I was angry as well. Um, and I expressed my frustration to the police officer as well. I just said, you know, this just does not feel right. And I asked her, does she feel comfortable doing it? And I could tell she didn't, but she was getting quite defensive. And for me, I was like, but it's okay. I could go around the corner and I could pull up to a supermarket and walk around the supermarket for an hour. I could pick up hundreds of things off shelves, be around hundreds of people in a confined place. But I couldn't be outdoors in nature having a walk. Stuff like that was really triggering me. I was thinking, what, what's going on? You know, it's crazy. And if we were to wind back, let's wind back. And I'm, I'm talking about this, you know, um, from my perspective. Say back late spring 2020, once we begin to realise the effects of COVID and what it's having on people, we realise that the average age of death was 82. So it's, it's very, it's, it's affecting the elderly. It's also affecting people with comorbidities, you know, who've got serious underlying health conditions like diabetes and, you know, cancer and heart disease, particularly anything to do with, you know, respiratory. Um, and, and also a lot of people who are obese. I had Dr. Anton Cricker on my podcast recently who has treated hundreds of people in the ICU unit with COVID and he said not one of them was slim. So once we begin to realise who this is affecting, and this is basically, it's affecting people of ill health. Imagine at that moment, at the end of May, at the, about May time 2020, we then began to put all our focus on empowering those individuals to get them well. And I know it's not possible to do it for, for all of people. And also, you know, if the average age of death is 82, and I believe the, the average life expectancy is around 81.5, People um, might criticise me for this, but, you know, those people were at the very end of their lives as well. And, of course, if we could help and protect them to live longer, brilliant. And I think we should and we can and we could have. So imagine instead, once we realised that at that time we had a real focus on improving health, like imagining if the government, rather than locking everyone down, we went all out to support people to improve their health and well-being. We delivered veg boxes to everyone on, on each week we empowered them to start learning how to cook we gave them the space to do that we give them the knowledge we've got a, a health epidemic going on and we have done for the past many decades look at the food that's in the supermarket you know look at what people are putting into the trolleys look at the amount of processed food meat crap that is going on to be in, on people's plates each night. And of course, you know, I'm not here to fat shame people or to shame people what they're eating, but it's a fact, isn't it? You know, it's a fact that the what we've been eating, the way we've been treating the planet, the way we've been degrading the soil for many years with um, all the different practices in, in farming, no wonder we are ill. No wonder we've got an uh, obesity uh, crisis in this country. No wonder that the likes of COVID, when it's come through, it's affected these people. So rather than targeting the younger people or the healthy people, if we would have had a real focus on protecting the, the vulnerable, imagine, like I said, imagine delivering them veg boxes. Imagine people all getting together and cooking and the ones who could cook food start cooking food for the neighbors who may be elderly or need some more support we come together as a community from a grassroots movement but also the government is empowering people as well along the way imagine saying you know what everyone you know we'll look at where we're going and the way the course of the planet is we need to get back to our roots why don't we start thinking about like you know what what does it mean to be human you know and obviously breaking bread and food and all that and community is building community back up from the ground encourage your people to grow food imagine if all the government sent out seed packs to everyone they gave them rather than furloughing people and paying people's wages they were giving them vouchers or money so they could build raised beds they could 
build a chicken coop and have chickens you know empower empowering people and for me this is the thing is when i listen to the government speak i do not feel empowered i do not feel empowered listening to boris johnson these are my opinions if you don't agree with them that's totally fine i would encourage you to continue to listen because i think it's important that we listen to people that we don't agree with people in my family we have different views but I can still respect them as a human being, um, as doing their best, because we've all got different perspectives, different viewpoints, and also different life situations to consider. So I can understand how certain people that I know would be very fearful of COVID because of their own health conditions. So they would support the lockdowns, they would support the vaccine passports, you know, anything to get back to normal or the idea of whatever normal is. I don't believe that's what they're offering us though by going down those paths. So we have to be willing to express um, our opinions, be open to expressing our opinions, but be willing to listen to what other people have got to say as well. Because I'm open to being challenged about my viewpoint because there's been many times over the past at least 10 years where I suddenly felt like I've, I've gained some great knowledge or experience of something and be like, wow, that's a big light bulb moment. I think well, that's the way everything should be. And then just six months, few years down the line to have that belief blown wide open again to then to be open to new information all the time because if we stay rigid with our views if we just stay fixed with our perception of the world we're not open to growth we're not open to change we're not open to evolving and i think that's what we're going through at the moment we're going through a massive transformation on the planet i i'm seeing it firsthand in my own life i'm seeing it with friends and family i'm seeing and yet it's a bumpy ride god this show is a bumpy ride you know people who know this podcast and know my spiritual beliefs i won't go too deep in that on this now but you know i believe everything can is happening for a reason and unfolding as a reason and i understand some of the things that i'm speaking about in this podcast are some of my own frustrations about how things are but also potentially do my best to see um, the good in it. I think we're at a crossroads in the moment. We're being given an opportunity to see which path do we want to go down. And when I've been tuning in recently to some of the things that have been going on in Australia, the how heavy handed the police have been with the lockdowns, the camps that they are but the quarantine camps that they are building and the measures and the way that they're speaking to people. Police brutality is kind of off the scale there. And then we're seeing that, we're seeing elements in this country, we're seeing it in America, um, and we're getting an opportunity. It's right in our face now. For me, I choose a path of freedom, okay? Three things that are very important to me. In fact, before I go into that, let's just go back to that this late spring 2020. Imagine, you know, empowering people, we're sending them veg boxes, neighbours are getting together, we're growing food for each other, um, you know, we're sending out seed packs, encouraging people to grow their own, grow their own food, sh- food sharing, building seed banks. Imagine if we, we also started, the government was supplying vitamins to people, you know, like sending out vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, magnesium, probiotics, um, you know, other forms of it to get to build people's, you know, the, the levels up. Because we've been shown, there's been plenty of studies that are showing how a lot of people who've died from COVID have been deficient in vitamin D. You know, for instance, my own experience with of that people who've listened to this podcast have know that I've worked with functional medicine doctors, I've worked with herbalists, I've worked with um, nutritional therapists to overcome some of my own health challenges that I've had. And I feel in a really feeling for me in a very quite empowered place about health. When I go to see these people like functional medicine doctors and nutritional therapists, I get filled with empowering information about how I can take control of my own health. And I think that's a big thing for what's coming up now is that You can either hand over and think you can just go to your normal GP and they'll give you some pills and that's going to solve something. Or we can realise that we have to, it takes a significant amount of work as well. We have to be willing to make the massive lifestyle changes. And it's hard because like I said, you'll go to the supermarket, you'll see the stuff that's on the shelves. Our choices might feel like the limit is. It's easy, you know, it's brought up a lot of trauma the past few years and you want to have comfort food. So, you know, I get it as well. Like I've felt that as well at times and, you know, and, We've had the odd pizza and um, probably ate too much chocolate and stuff like that. But for me, it's bringing my back to my fundamentals and making sure that am I taking enough vitamins each day? Am I getting outside fresher exercise? How's my sleep? Now, to be honest, my sleep is shot to shit since we've had a little one. She's going to be one um, very soon. So my sleep has certainly been off and any any new parent can testify to that. That is, God, it's challenging with a, with a little one when you're co-sleeping with them and she's in the bed with you. Um, but I wouldn't have it any other way. 
because um, yeah, she's let let up my world the past twelve months. Anyway, I digress. But my own experience, anyway, taking vitamin D for our last winter, I take uh, vitamin D free. And I take 2,000 IUs of that a day and did do throughout the winter. And I did uh, blood tests in around about May time, April, May time, which was to check my thyroid and also checked all my vitamin levels as well. And it come back, my vitamin D came back in the normal range, but it came in the lower part of the normal range. And it makes me really wonder how if i wasn't taking that 2000 iu throughout winter what levels would have my vitamin d now as i speak now you know it appears that me and my family have been unaffected from covid we don't know if we've caught it and not been affected you know there's so many asymptomatic people we don't know if they had antibody we haven't done any tests on that but i wonder because you know we take zinc each day we take magnesium we take vitamin d we take vitamin c um, as well as eating a whole food diet as well, I believe we're putting ourselves in a good position rather than feeling like um, disempowered. Like, you know, it's always threatened, like, you know, this could happen to you. It's not really saying like, yeah, you know, like for instance, one thing that really frustrates me is when you watch, occasionally you'll see like an advert and it'll talk about cancer and it'll say one in two people are going to get cancer. So if you're sat there watching the TV with your partner, it's like, oh, one of us is going to get it. But actually, your lifestyle choices can make a huge difference. I was listening to a podcast recently called um, Balance Balance Five or something. The English guy lives over in America. I'll, I'll put a link to the podcast. And he was talking about he had a doctor on and on one of his podcasts. And he spoke about seed oils and how bad seed oils are for us. And it showed a study that if, if someone smoked 20 cigarettes a day for 20 years, they had an 18% chance of catching lung cancer. Now... The same people, same study or whatever showed that if people ate, had seed oil each day, you know, sunflower oil, other vegetable oils that would be cooking with, they had something like a 70 plus percent chance of catching cancer because it so, causes so much inflammation in, in your health around, around your organs, which can then lead to cancer. Now, so actually that one in two is like that because of lifestyle choices. And unfortunately, people are doing it unconsciously, unknowingly. They think they're picking something off of the packet. It says like it's low fat or low calories or whatever, but not realizing the stuff that's in it. They think they're eating healthy, but sadly, the way the world's gone, we're not. So if we can make more empowered choices with our health and our diet and our lifestyle, we're not going to be one in two chance of catching cancer. It's going to be one in 10. It's going to be one in 20. If you look back to our way of being, our ancestral way of living, you know, people would have had Dr. Sarah Mayhill on my podcast last year, an amazing woman doing incredible work, helped millions of people around the world with her information to empower them to take control of their own health. She would talk about like ancestral living. You know, if we were in a good place, you would live to a ripe old age. And it might even be in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s. And you would just get ill at the very end of your life. You might even just die in your sleep or you might get ill and have a very fast decline in the course of a few days or a few weeks. The way we're living now, people are living with chronic health conditions for 20, 30 years. are really suffering in the health. I know people in my own family are really suffering with their own health. I, I've had time and I feel like I've suffered with my own health. I've spoken about it in this podcast. But it sent me down a journey to find out new ways of living to get back to my roots. And I follow very much like an ancestral way of living now. I follow more of a paleo keto style diet. Yeah, I'll still occasionally have, I, I'm allowing myself to have the odd pizza now and again. I might have uh, a cider or whatever or, you know, eat a bit of gluten here and there. I used to be super strict and now I'm kind of like easing up a bit because I feel like I've got my health into a lot better position. But I still, it's like what you do, for me it's what you do 80, 90% of the time. So imagine if back in April, in spring, this is why when I, when, because of my own health journey that I've gone on for the past two decades, when I hear what the government were doing and what they're proposing, I'm thinking, where's the empowering information? Where is the information where you're building people up? You're making them feel good. You're not getting them feel scared. You put people into a state of panic and fear. Stress is one of the biggest killers. We're seeing that. We know that. Yet that's what's getting spouted through the media. That's what's getting put when you pick up a newspaper. That's what you, when you listen to the government. I want people in positions of power that empower me. And for me, I don't listen to Boris Johnson or other, other leaders. I'm saying leaders in inverted commas. For me, people that empower me is people who are 
individuals who have got their own podcasts maybe it's someone like ben greenfield who's a fitness expert or other people that i've had on my podcast these are the people that i think of as leaders people that i can trust more because unfortunately i think our systems that are in place the hierarchy of our structures have been co-opted we only have to see the amount of billions and tr- and uh, that have been siphoned and gone to make people even richer over the past year how big the farms how much influence the pharmaceutical industry has how big business is basically running government they are writing policies they are running a mock for me um and i think for me it's it's coming it's coming out more than any now for now and one thing that I've has been come aware, and I think it's for, I'm I'm grateful for this time in many ways because it's showing for me what's out of alignment for me, and also bringing stuff up to the surface for me to think, well, what's really important to me in my life? Was I probably just you know going along with some stuff, even though I feel like I've charted a different course in my life, the way I live, the way I work, um, etc. I was still getting you know had things that were not in the light for me you know i wasn't i wasn't aware of them but one thing that's become really important for me i realized like i strongly believe in that important to me is freedom of speech freedom of choice and freedom of movement now when i think about freedom of speech anyone who has stuck their head up particularly who's got a decent following over the past 18 months and has gone against the narrative is either getting the mob the twitter mob attacked on them they're either getting deplatformed they're getting a, a sticker that gets put up saying fake news interestingly i shared something on my own facebook a while ago which was talking about a a study that was in the lancet which looked at the the efficacy of the vaccines i don't know if you remember back in january time it said you know pfizer vaccine was like 95 percent effective i think we can see now that that isn't the case the amount of breakthrough cases the amount of people that have been vaccinated that are dying still it's showing that no it doesn't seem to be anywhere personally it doesn't look like 95 but there's another study that showed it was much lower than that and it was in the lancet I shared it and Facebook put a, a thing over it saying this has been fact checked and it's false. I then get a notification to say that um, part, some of this information by some Australian news organisation has found that partially, partially some of this information is false. From anyone viewing my fo- Facebook post, it was showing that it was false. So already, what happened to allowing people to express opinions, share information... And allow people to make up their own mind. It feels as if, for me, there's an official narrative that's being pushed out. And anyone who deviates off it, it's just being shut down. For me, when that's getting shut down, it's showing that there's issues with the official narrative. Clear and day, showing that it's the official narrative has um, has got holes in it, big holes in it. There's loads of doctors and scientists that have spoken up massively over the past 18 months, have either been deplatformed, they've had not been able to um, share information, taken off Facebook, taken off Twitter, taken off YouTube, videos put down. And that for me, that is a very, it's set a precedent and we need to be really careful of that. And I really believe in freedom of speech. We need to live in a society where we can have open, honest conversations. And science is all about questioning stuff. Yet, how it's been, it's like as if no, the science is set. Science is all about questioning stuff. So we should, as individuals, be able to question stuff. And people will say, well, you're not a scientist, you're not a doctor. And that's like part of the narrative that gets swayed. So you're not allowed to have an opinion. You only have to listen to the experts and doctors that get wheeled out in front of the TV. But there's plenty of doctors and scientists who are, who are not saying that are saying the lockdowns don't work, are saying that children shouldn't be vaccinated, are saying that we should actually be vaccinating the vulnerable and um, the elderly, not having just a, a, a sweeping um, approach across it. Freedom of speech is really important for me, and I didn't realise how important it was for me until maybe this has happened in the past 18 months when you feel like those freedoms are being taken away from you also freedom of choice we are having it's sweeping around the world these covid passports for me that goes against freedom of choice and the thing that's become very apparent is they don't stop getting the covid vaccine does not stop you catching covid and it doesn't stop you spreading it so straight away there you go for me how can you possibly create a covid passport for getting into places if it doesn't stop you getting out spreading it and that's for me when i look at it it's not about health for me it's about control it's about power 
People may disagree with that, but I really very believe strongly in this, that the COVID passports are immoral, there's going to create a two-seer society, and it could be one of the most authoritarian thing, measures that gets put into place around the world, and in, in this country particularly, in our time. And for me, it's about holding the line. It's about saying no to this. And I know plenty of people who have been vaccinated and are against this as well. It's interesting how 12 months ago, people that warned to saying, you know, part of the end game is from the the governments and the, the measures is to create uh, COVID passports so people can, can't go, can only move around freely if they've got the jab. They were written off as conspiracy nuts. Well, now it is. And I heard something recently that, you know, the difference with the, the difference between a conspiracy and a fact now is about six months. And I think it's really important that we look into this and maybe delve a bit deeper into what do these COVID passports tie into. It seems to me it's more about getting people's data. And you might think, oh, it's just data. But what does that data lead to? It leads to a digital ID. It can lead to a social credit card system like what's in China. It could really, It's going to most likely, if it does push ahead, it'll lead to a digital currency, which will be so they'll be able to control everything um full on and that's probably that's when it maybe becomes checkmate anyway i don't want to go too down that far away but i will say and i'm going to say openly now at this moment in time i have not been vaccinated against covid and if i choose to get the jab then i'll be doing it for health reasons i won't be doing it just so i can go to a club or to a footy match and people might say well don't be selfish i think most of the people have probably got it have got it because they want to go and do stuff they want to go on holiday they want to go do things like when the government came out and said in you know was it july or august oh by the way young adults from october you're going to need a covid pass to get into clubs you know do you think they were going out to do that because they wanted to think for their own health no they were going to do things well i have to do this and for me i could say i will do I, if i decide to do this to get a COVID vaccine. Well, one, I'll be waiting until 2023 when the clinical trials are over. To think that we're pushing this on, particularly on young people and children at this time, when it's still in the clinical trials, we don't understand the long-term effects. Like just recently, was it something like 35,000 uh, women in the UK alone? That's probably minimum who have complained about serious issues to the, to the periods each month. You know, how, what what effect do we think that might have on fertility? You know, that's these questions that can't be answered early on when you're just trialing something in just the first few months or the first few years, you know. It was almost, how many, how many months did it take before it got approved to be used? For me, I would definitely be waiting until then. I will not be coerced into it. You know, like I said, I feel like in a pretty empowered place with my health. I'm 41, I'm, I'm slim, I'm, um, I exercise i meditate etc i'm looking at the data i'm looking at the stats the odds of someone like that happening affecting me and it's not just saying it won't i'm not here to say you know i'm bulletproof because i don't feel like that i'm bulletproof anything could happen at any one time but i feel more in a power place for my health and well-being and i wish through a lot of the interviews i'm doing with people i speak to also empower other people to take control of their own health and their own well-being not feel like they're at the the being Oh, you know what I'm saying anyway. You know what I'm saying. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to go too much on this on this one, but I do feel like, like I said, it's the, I feel like it's always darkest before the dawn. And we're beginning an opportunity right now to see the path that could potentially be unfolding to us. I remember, I think I've shared some of this information in the past. Imagine it like train tracks. And we've got an opportunity now at the station now, but the trains are leaving. And we need to decide which train that we want to get on. Do we want to move down one which can look like a dystopian version of the future where we can't have much freedom of movement? We have to show our papers to get into supermarkets even, which could be the line of coming. It happens. It's happened in France. Do you think it won't happen here? It's happened in France. You Knowing that you've always got to go get your booster shot to be able to tune back into society. Do you want to go to a point where there's a social credit score system, where there's, everyone's got a digital ID, where all your money's stored on the government's... Um, digital currency where they've got full control on it can turn it off and they can have full control and power over society that is one train that is put it's going off and we're seeing it it's in front of us it's not just some five ten twenty years away or do we want to get on a different path on a different train 
One which is about freedom of choice, freedom of movement and freedom of speech. One where we live in a powered society where we have systems in place that support the well-being of all you know, we've got these choices. I choose to get on that, you know, and I choose to live more in community, finding our tribe. I feel like we've got a great opportunity to find like-minded individuals, build our tribe, live off our land, be growing more food. It's something we've done over the past 12 months. I was very aware. I was like, you know, look at the f- food system, how fragile it is. We got some chickens every morning. I take my little girl out with me and we collect the eggs from our chicken. We say thank you to those chickens. At the moment, I've got an abundance of apples and pears coming off our trees. I've not had to buy any salad over over the summer months. Um, lettuce and kale growing. You know, that feels really good for me. And I, and I think it can be one of the most empowering things is to learn to grow our own food, to learn to feed our family. I didn't know how to cook really until I was about early 30s and I've really gone at it fast and hard and felt really excited and empowered to to grow food, to be able to like feed my family and I think it's one of the best things I can do for my daughter is to give her healthy nutrition meals each morning, each afternoon and each evening um, rather than something out of a packet and, um, and I'm not here to judge people, I'm just saying I understand it's challenging. And what you can do is, we can, and I still know I've got a long way to go as well. I could be learning new stuff and um, going down, but that feels really good for me to know that I can impart some of the stuff that I've been learning onto my daughter and hopefully give her a great start to her life and keep her in a really good place. So for me, I'm really open to building more communities and like me and my wife, I think I spoke about it in other podcasts, looking to move and I'm interested in maybe Wales or some part of it, something where we can live closer to nature. But I don't just want to do it on my own. I want to live in community. I would like to live with like-minded individuals, people to live so we've got like a shared space. Imagine imagine if there was a um, a space and there was 20 families, but we also had a shared hub at the, at the centre of it. We could come together, we could break bread, we could, um, um, you know, have campfires. We can... Um, you know, watch documentaries and movies together. The kids can be running around wild, running in the, you know, running in the stream, climbing trees. Hell, I'll be climbing the trees with the kids and stuff. This is a future. Like, I get excited and I'm talking about this. You know, this is the train track that I'm moving towards. And the past 18 months has accelerated this urge within me and to get more focused rather than think, oh, you know, it'll happen in five, 10 years, is actually no to get clear on that now. That is the train track that I want to get on. And I want, I would love for as many people to get on that path as possible. And I'm seeing more and more people being open to this way of living that we need to get back to our roots. We need to live into community. We need to live in a more decentralized way. We need to live a way where um, decentralized power, for sure, uh, giving power back to the individuals, to communities from a ground up approach. That is the path, the train that I'm getting on. In fact, I'm going to say I'm on that train, okay? It just happens that I can see that other train as well. And I don't like the look of that train, which path that, that's going down. And I'm grateful. And that's why I can be grateful for these times. I can look at this time and go, God, has it been triggering? It's been super triggering, particularly around the COVID passports. You know, I kind of thought, well, they might do this about traveling abroad. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to sit tight on this. And one thing that we've done is I bought a van, a big white van, a um, Sprinter long wheelbase van, and I'm going to be converting it. Well, I've started converting it into a home on wheels. We've put in the windows. I put in the um, the roof fan um, yesterday. And that feels really good for me. Like this is my way of saying, well, okay, if I can't get on a plane, I can't do this. And when, if my freedom, of, my move, movement is going to be affected, well, okay, we're going to get a van. We're going to do the van up. We've got a home on wheels. We can go anywhere, whenever we want, however we want around the country. So having that van feels like one, it's a great project. Like for me, um, we could have just bought a new one. Well, actually we couldn't have because we haven't got the money to buy a new one, which can cost 30 odd thousand pound or more to have one fully kitted out because I'm going to be putting like, you know, fixed bed in there, opportunity for a single bed, going to have a toilet, shower, um, full working kitchen. And for us to be able to move, and I love the opportunity and freedom it's going to give us to go all around the UK in it, and also to just go at a moment's notice. You know, the issue of our country is often the weather, and you could book off some time, two weeks off, a week off, and I'm going to go way away on this date. But if you can be open and flexible, say, well, you know what, weather's looking good this weekend, let's just go. 
let's just shoot off. Um, so I feel really excited about that, and it ties into this, you know, living in community and going, going and exploring other places. I'm really interested in some of the communities in the UK. There's one up in Scotland called Fintorn. I'd love to go and spend some time there. There is in Wales. There's something called Spirit Horse and Lamas, which look like amazing places to go as well. This is the path that I choose to be more down the line. I do feel like there's so many positives that have come from this time, but I also feel like that we need to shed some light on the darkness that's going around and and not be um, scared to speak up about it because that's how they get, I think, they're able to push it through. People scared to speak up. And I have it as well. I do. And I'm a little uncomfortable saying some of the stuff that I've said in this podcast, but it's my truth. And I'm be willing to change my mind at some point. If new information comes to me about stuff, I, I will be open. I'm open to exploring that. I'm not going to stay closed off. I'm going to stay open to listen to stuff. But I think we have to stand up. This is an opportunity to stand up for what we believe in, to find our voice. Because if things keep going the way they are, that voice may be, you know, might even have the opportunity to speak up. And something else I just want to finish with um, positively is... Um, I've just coming right to the end of Eckhart Tolle's book, A New Earth. I would encourage anyone to read that book. Um, it's something that is him as an individual is, I think, one of the most authentic person living today is Eckhart Tolle. Someone is so pure in his in his speech. Someone is so, you know, not living from his ego. Nothing's about control. It really is about humanity. And I think the wisdom that comes out of his mouth is coming from a higher source for sure, because he has completely moved away from his ego-driven life of uh, the way he would have been to live in a whole human being who is very much connected to source. And he will speak, and I've heard this from other spiritual teachers for the past, for, I've heard them probably talk about for the last six or seven years, is that as the consciousness of the planet rises, which I believe it is, because we have to shift to a new way of being, a new way of living, what will happen during that time is that whatever is out of alignment will come to the surface. And we're, I think that's what we are seeing now. We are seeing the corrupt institutions, the corrupt governments, the corrupt corporations around the world and the power that they hold. And what doesn't feel like it's for the best of humanity as a whole, I think it's very much for the few. It's a concentration of power. We are being this opportunity now as consciousness rises on the planet to see what's out of alignment and we get given a choice. It's no longer in the shadows anymore. It's now up in the surface. And that can be fear-inducing for sure, but it's because the truth is rising. And we get an opportunity now to choose what is our truth and what path that we want to go down. I think this is a, probably the most amazing time to be alive. And it can be the most fear-inducing, the most challenging. Um, but I think we've got so much opportunity for growth. And when it comes down in the next however many decades or years that we're on this planet for, we can look back and go, wow, you know, but look how this has been an opportunity to transform not only our lives, but the world for the better. Now, a quote that I shared on my social media channels just recently, I just want to finish with that, really. It's from someone called Rachel Marie Martin. And it says, you don't learn how strong you are until you are pushed beyond what you thought you could handle. And you emerge on the other side with more bravery, grace and determination than you realise you ever had. I 100% resonate with that. We are right at the edge of our comfort zone. In fact, that comfort blanket has been whipped away from us. Now we are having to stand up and be strong and take a step forward uh, into the unknown. And I think we're very much going to be taking the road less travelled. We're going to be taking a leap into the unknown in the coming years and decades. And we have to look at the planet, look at the world, look at the way things are. I hope you enjoyed this episode today. I have, um, like I said, I've not done a solo episode in a while. I've found that my time has been somewhat restricted being a father, um, but I'm still very excited doing this podcast. Still love speaking with people. I've been going for three years now. Three years doing this podcast, still going. I mean, this is episode in the 70s. I feel still feel like so uh, alive doing it. I'd encourage anyone to find something that they get really excited about do it from uh, a place of enjoyment and um, a place of enthusiasm. 
And it's because there's times, I've felt times recently of just like jacking it all in. You can feel like that. No one can feel overwhelmed and there's too much going on in your life. And you're like, oh, I need to let everything go. Or just keep the essentials. But this, for me, doing this podcast is one of my essentials. It's an opportunity for me to play my part, my role in creating this new earth that Eckhart Tolle talks about. And I wish for you to be on this ride with me. I really do appreciate you listen to this um if you've enjoyed this episode please share it with a friend if you listen to it on apple please leave me a review that would be amazing and if you listen to it on youtube you can like and subscribe to the channel so you can always get episodes you can also subscribe to my mailing list for future episodes anyway um thank you for listening i really appreciate your time i hope you are having a very good day anyway until next time have a good one mm-hmm.